St. Basil, uh, he's a very big advocate for the poor. He says, you are a thief. If you have an extra pair of shoes you haven't worn, and they're hanging out in your closet while your brother is out in the streets bare. Well, let's be frank. So, so we want to speak like you want to speak truth. Let's speak truth. So our faith tells us that there's one thing that we will take in heaven. And that is our soul. The wealth that was granted to Abraham was given to him because the Lord knew that he would be able to use that for the sake of others sustenance. The mother that comes up to you after their liturgy. Yeah. And she tells you, my son is too nice. He can't get far in life. He's too nice. People are stepping on him. Yeah. And he's so kind. And this is what's happening every time they step on him and they step on him. What is your answer? You must begin now by doing what? By recognizing that your desk is an altar. Be the best version of yourself and love your neighbor as yourself. Mm. Welcome back to the COA podcast. We're very blessed today to have Father Gabriel and Father Anthony with us again. Uh, today we're going to tackle something that uh, we like to talk a lot about, especially in the Western world, and uh, many of us always have these questions. So we're going to hopefully tackle luxury, ambition, wealth uh, in our world today and how that equates with spirituality. Welcome, fathers. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul. So starting right off the bat, just to get it out of the way. What is ambition? What is godly ambition? How do we decipher between the two? Is there a way to reconcile between the two? Hmm. I think ambition can be defined as the aim that we place for ourselves in our lives, the end goal of what it is that we are pursuing as human beings. And I think to a certain extent, I think it's very natural for us to recognize that when the Lord created us in his image and likeness, that a big part of what it means for us to be rational and relational human beings, that we have ambition, that we have certain goals that we want to achieve. Now, unfortunately, we have to be honest and confess that some of those ambitions um, can be unfortunately misdirected and misdirected toward, towards things that are very worldly, that are very fallen, that are very corrupt. Um, and this is where you get very selfish ambition. The desire to be the best, the richest, the smartest, the most powerful, the most respected. And all of these things can be completely against the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Godly ambition is where you make your goal, your desired outcome, to be the kingdom of God, the fulfillment through obedience of his will in your life, your holiness, your sanctification, your edification. And so I think we have to figure out how to distinguish between both of those kinds of ambitions. And while ambition in and of itself is not something that is bad, I think the end goal that you have for that ambition can be something that could be dangerous. So before we delve into the kinds of ambition and, and the different roads we can take there, on just a curiosity, we're spiritually always brought up with the ideals of humility, right? Ambition almost by definition seems impossible to marry with the idea or the concept of humility how can you want to be hmm. better and strive for more and it, it, baked in ambition is almost to be better than your neighbor or to even if it's godly ambition right when you tell me godly ambition what, what does that mean I, like more spiritual more fervent you know more knowledgeable how can i marry any of the, any of those with humility I, I think there's a difference between ambition as an individual in the setup of a competition type of thing, one versus the other, when we pin ourselves against the other, and that is a very unchristian type of ambition. Versus an ambition as a community, right? So, so obviously I do not lose myself as a person in the midst of this community. However, my responsibility extends to that community. So if I give, for example, uh, the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, right? So here, again, we all know this parable, the rich man, right, is there living sumptuously, eating and drinking, you know, partying every day. You have this beggar, Lazarus, wants to eat the crumbs off the table, right, that falls from the rich man. He does not want to give him anything. They both die. Lazarus goes to heaven in Abraham's bosom, right, while the rich man goes to hell. So St. John Chrysostom says something very nice here. He says, there is a reason why Abraham is mentioned. He says, the mere presence of Abraham convicts the rich man. 
Why is that? Because Abraham was very rich. Yet that same Abraham was very hospitable. So he sits down at the tent, you know, passers-by come and go and he feeds them, he lodges them, right? And it was even, even got to a point where he entertained angels, right? Like we see in the book of Genesis. So Abraham is a perfect example of a man who is blessed by God and it's quite evident but at the same time remains humble. That means loving and caring. So there's a difference between, like I said, uh, being blessed and having that ambition while being able to extend that responsibility you know, towards the other meaning. When, when I have wealth, let's say I'm ambitious, right? It's like I, I have whatever uh, career one has. Is it okay to be ambitious? In the sense that is it okay for me to do the best that I can do? Absolutely. I think we are wired that way. And success is definitely a good thing. So I, I should be the best engineer that I can be, the best project manager, doctor, dentist, whomever, pharmacist, regardless, regardless of the position. But when I have fed myself and have taken care of my family, because it is a priority, right? It's a responsibility in front of God. What do I do with that excess of money? Does my responsibility stop there and it becomes me against the world type of thing? So me and the other? Or does my responsibility extend to the other? The idea of the community, the idea of fellowship, the one body of Christ, right? The one human nature. So I think that we have to understand that the extra wealth that we have, because we've been blessed, you know, by growing up in the West and living in the West and having that kind of money, so to speak, uh, becomes a responsibility towards the other. So it's not about me, you know, increasing my wealth to increase or elevate my social status or to, to necessarily buy more stuff so people can look at me and that type of thing, right? No, it does become a responsibility. And at this point, yes, you can absolutely reconcile the idea of ambition and humility or, or just being a godly man at the same time. Um, and obviously it's a spectrum, right? It's a spectrum. Someone can be, you know, ready spiritually to be geared towards of giving a lot. Someone can give a bit less, but at least the idea, the concept has to be there in our mind. It's interesting that you mention Abraham because when you read you know, about Abraham in the Bible, he doesn't strike you as an ambitious person. He strikes mm -hmm. you as a person that God has blessed despite not wanting mm -hmm. anything. So while it's a great example, I kind of, I'm almost trying to like rack my brain on the spot and think like, is there an example of someone who was ambitious or who was, you know, that had that and then God blessed them too? Like, where is it, where's that line between healthy ambition and greed? Because I can't really find anyone to use, you know, in that example. So I find it really interesting that even in the way that you pose the question, hmm. you've already given a definition to the word ambition that you're using. So when you say, I can't find anybody that's ambitious, hmm. you've already applied a certain outlook to what that word means to you, right? Because even in the way that you're posing the question, hmm. you're implying whether you like it or not about ambitions in the sense where I am pursuing worldly success. And you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. In that sense, that definition does not apply to Abraham. But to, su to suggest that Abraham was not spiritually ambitious, oh my goodness, absolutely not. There's a reason why he is one of the patriarchs of the faith. His ambition was to make sure that he remains faithful to the covenant that God made with him. And he's so faithful to this, that this is where he sees blessing upon blessing upon blessing upon blessing. So if you understand ambition as identifying your goal and pursuing it at any and all cost and making God and his kingdom and his will your goal, then Abraham, whether we like it or not, mm -hmm. becomes a prime example of what it looks like to be ambitious towards the kingdom. And it's really interesting because exactly as Father was just saying right now, the, the, the wealth that was granted to Abraham was given to him because the Lord knew that he would be able to use that for the sake of others' sustenance. Even to the point where when he's offered the possibility of choosing which land he will choose, mm -hmm. he takes second option. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He says, absolutely not. You take whichever you like. I'll take the leftovers. Trusting in the fact that what? 
my goal is not towards which land is more fertile, which one is going to bring me more wealth, which one is going to give me a better status. His focus was always Christ. So if we are looking through scripture to try to find a holy and righteous character that also happens to be ambitious towards the world, I'm not really sure we're going to find. The closest thing we might get to is the young rich man who comes to see Christ in the Gospels and he tells him, tell me how I could be perfect, right? Mm -hmm. And we know how that story ends. Yeah. But, but even Abraham, like, I mean, when, when, when Lot was taken, you can see that he, ha he has that zeal in him. When, when Lot was taken, you know, uh, along with his family and, and all his possessions, he got them out. He went and he fought, yeah. you know, and, and he warred and he got them out along with his flock and whatnot, right? So, so he, he's not, of course, like this is not, the, the, this earthly ambition will never be emphasized in scripture, but it doesn't mean that the man, you know, was lazy. Doesn't mean that the man didn't care, right? No, he, he took care. Once you have a flock, once you're a shepherd, mm. that's, that's not an easy life, right? You, you, you have to work mm. to maintain. You have to work to protect. So all these things are not explicitly said, but it, don't mean, it doesn't mean that it's not part of his life. You alluded to it, but you can kind of expand. The idea of reconciling material success, not just the ambition, but the actual having of success with spiritual value. We're a faith, we're, we're a church that is very heavy on simplicity and humility giving to the poor. And this we understand all these concepts. But people who have been blessed, the Abrahams of the world, the mm -hmm. Solomons of the world, the mm -hmm. Davids of the world, that's a, that's a hard one to marry, you know, post-New Testament. It's difficult to find, you know, the, the saint who, most of our synexarium or, our, you know, the lives of our saints, it's the ones who gave up everything, you know, for Christ. It's difficult to find, you know, a uh, uh, a commemoration of a saint who was extremely rich and kept those riches and then it's difficult to marry is there a way how does one bring those two together so so it, god says if you want to be perfect go sell all that you have and come and follow me right so but he doesn't say if you want to be a christian sell all that you have right so so the idea here is that there is such a thing as walking towards the path of perfection in Christianity. A and those people do reach the level of sainthood. And that's why when we look at the conversation of the saints and whatnot, and we hear of all these stories, it's a common factor that we find in them that they have chosen poverty because they don't rely on the world anymore. Like when you speak about, you know, St. Paul, the, the first hermit who has absolutely nothing and then a bird has to come and give him his food on a daily basis. He does not rely on the world. So obviously these stories are, are up there, right? So there is a reason why things are like that. However, can I be a Christian um, and not live poverty in that sense, you know, by choice? Absolutely. I, I can be a Christian and not be a perfect Christian, but my objective should always be towards that idea of perfection. But I think also is that it depends on where my heart is, right? So again, this, this example of, of Lot and Abraham is perfect because Lot is here, the, he's the uncle, right? So he has in essentially primacy of choice. He can choose which land he wants. But he saw it through, or he saw the material stuff through the lens of God. He has priorities in his life. God is his foundation. So he says, okay, like even I have the primacy of choice, I'm going to give you, right, the first choice. You choose. And Lot chose with an earthly perspective. Abraham, you mean Abraham. So Abraham, Ab Abraham chose. So, so, Lot, so Abraham gave Lot the choice mm -hmm. to choose right. the land. Sorry, maybe I said otherwise. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so Lot chose, right? But again, with a very earthly perspective. And that led to this whole idea of Sodom and Gomorrah and the destruction of his wealth essentially, while Abraham's wealth remained. So if we have God, you know, as the foundation and our hearts lie with God, then I think we are safe. But if our hearts are in the world, we have a problem. So I actually remember the story um, 
that my uncle like told me and it happened to him directly and he was very, very touched by it. Uh, it's the story of this very, very rich man in Egypt that had a lot of money. He built this huge mansion, right? It took months, years to build, right? And as he's about to start living in it because it was done. And as soon as, as he's about to start living in it, he's diagnosed stage four cancer, no chance for him, right? But the touchy part that my uncle was so touched by and, and, he, and he was very afraid for himself actually, is that the man's reaction was to walk in the mansion and he would like touch the walls, look at the ceiling and the floor, he would kiss the walls. It's like, I, I can't believe I worked so hard, you know, to have this mansion and I'm not gonna profit from it. I'm not gonna use it, I'm not gonna enjoy it. Mm. So where is, where's his heart, mm. right? Well, you have other rich people that are Christian and you, you know they're Christian. They might be millionaires, billionaires, you know they're Christian. You know, you just know, you know by, by their humility, you know, you might not know how much they give to the church and give to the poor, but you know that they give. When, when, when they speak to you, what they speak about is God. What they speak about is the poor. So it's all about where your heart is. And if my heart is in the right place, I think, you know, we will understand more and more that we have the responsibility to take care of others. Oh, I always try to bring us back. We all have children, okay? And in our culture, every child must grow up to be a doctor, an engineer, a lawyer, <laughs> mm -hmm. some, some, some variant, okay? Yeah. Because that's very important. And I'm sure there's a lot of cultures out there that those are the only options. There are no other options, right? Uh, we push our children to be the best. You know, they get 99. And the famous thing that every person knows about their father and mother, especially in our culture, why didn't you get 100? Where was that 1%? You know, it's like, Dad, I got 99%. Where was that 1%? You know, and they're very serious about it. They're not even kidding. We push and we push and we want to strive and be ambitious and succeed to get the good job, to be the, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, a, it's a big push. And from what we've been saying so far, that's not really a spiritual push. How? Where are we supposed to go from here? Because our children, we're also not going to tell them, you know, no, don't study, don't strive, don't. But are we not setting them up with this kind of pressure that that is the ultimate goal? This earthly success, this earthly status. So I'm, re I'm really happy you brought this up because I think if there is anything, and I'm sure Father will agree with me on this, if there is anything that our children can benefit from, is having parents who make the kingdom the number one priority mm -hmm. and our children being taught to desire the kingdom here and our children being taught that everything that they do here successfully is an offering to God and his kingdom is what will lead them to the successes that we want to see. So St. John Chrysostom has this homily that he, that he writes out and he speaks to parents and I promise you, it feels like St. John Chrysostom is living us, with us today in the 21st century. He says, I wish, I wish that you desired your children's spiritual success just as much as you desire their worldly success. If you taught them to read the scriptures as much as you make them study for school, your children would be saints. And why is he saying this? Because he sees that there's, there's no balance there. Now, should that then translate into, we shouldn't be pushing our children to be their best? Well, let, let's go back to that original question you were asking just a few questions ago. You were talking about, doesn't ambition necessarily necessitate that I'm supposed to compete with everyone else? No. True and real ambition given to us by God, whispered to us by the Holy Spirit, is one where you are constantly asking yourself, how can I fulfill my potential in God? And pushing yourself to be the best that you can be doesn't have to translate into me comparing myself to anyone else. The proof of this is in the parable of the talents. When he passes out the talents, one, five, and 10, when he does this, the, the purpose was never to compare to say, Yalla, this is going to be a competition to see who's mm. going to have more at the end. The expectation is, what will you do with what I have given to you? If you bury it, then God is not pleased with you. If you have no form of ambition, and by the way, People don't know this, but at the level of like the context of scripture, 
People think of a talent as if it was like nothing. That poor guy who got one talent got nothing. As a matter of fact, a single talent is a measurement of wealth. So a single talent is like a, literally like a, 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 small, a small fortune because it was the equivalent of almost 20 years of wages. So one talent is 20 years of wages. So what was given to them was a significant amount of money. So that even that person who got one talent, he could have used that. He could have done something with it. When he buried it, the Lord is not pleased with him. Mm. The expectation is, how will you fulfill your potential? Now, the person who had 10 did something with it. The person who had five did something with it. But never did the Lord say to the one who had more, you did better than the others. No. But he did compare them, right? He did tell him, why didn't you do like the other? But this is precisely, this is precisely the issue. The point of comparison with those who used their talent was always where they began and where they ended. It was never in comparison to someone else. But the person who did nothing, the only point of comparison was, why did you do nothing? Do you think if he had doubled it, like the others had doubled it, that he also would not have heard the words, well done? Absolutely. My father confession used to say this to me all the time when I was a student, and I used to always ask him this question that I think many of us have considered at some point. If the point of all of this is the kingdom of God, why, why do, am I even bothering? Like, why? Why do I have to go to school? Why do I have to put myself through this like misery of trying to study and please everyone? Why can't I just stay home, read my Bible, become some holy person, and then when I die, I meet the Lord, right? And my father confession would tell me, no, the purpose is for you to be able to use your God-given talents to bring glory to him yeah. and to serve his children. So he used to tell me what? You must begin now. Now, by doing what? By recognizing that your desk is an altar. Your books are an offering. And you are a priest that opens those books and offers your, your investment of time and energy as an offering to the Lord. I think this is a great example of how it is that we are expected to be ambitious in the sense where we try to fulfill our potential in God. So, so can I say just in a different way in, in, in 10 seconds? I think like if I summarize what Father Anthony said is be the best version of yourself and love your neighbor as yourself. Mm. If we often as parents focus on number one, while the number two becomes secondary. Forgive me, Father. Yeah. I wish it was we always focus on the first. I think what a lot of our parents would say to their children is be better than others. Yeah, which not is even, even worse. I don't, I don't care if you're not the best version of you, as yeah. long as you're better than others, yeah, which is quite dangerous. Yeah. Right. Just, Danny, to be fair to the parents, I'm going to take their side for a second. Not their side, but I'm going to argue on their behalf, okay? Sorry to be a pain. Is you? Is this be you being Papa now and recognizing? No, this is, <laughs> yes, <laughs> but at the same time, this is me just, you know, wanting to ask the following question, which I'm sure everyone wants to ask. <laughs> I'm sure everyone is watching and saying that was really beautiful, and it really was, and God grant us to live that way, okay? However, the game of life right now <laughs> is that you are constantly compared with everyone around you and that is the measurement of success. Example, I don't know if that's still how it is, but when I was in Sejep, in Quebec here, we have the Sejep system, something called an R score. That R score is not my average in all these things that I've studied, it's my average, but also a comparison of how everyone else did. We all get our kids, you know, report cards. We look at their grade first, and then what do we look at next? the class average. Why? We want to know how our children are faring next to everyone else. To get a promotion, to be promoted by definition, you must be shining above everyone that is next to you. It's the same in sports. It's the same in academia. It's the corporate world. So I get it and I love it. And I wish that this is the ideal, but we live in the world now. So help us, help us dissect Pick a surgical, spiritual scalpel to, I live in this world that necessitates that I be the best from everyone around me. You but do have yet annoying questions. By. You do have annoying questions, but we still love you. <laughs> okay. um, but, but I would challenge that. So I, I, I see what you're saying, absolutely. Uh, but I would challenge that with something else that is also worldly. Um, the, the concept of leadership, right? So, so, so there's a difference between like, let's say being a boss or, or being a leader, right? A and you are a good leader when you bring others up. 
So you invest in yourself in the sense that, okay, like I want to get better. Again, this whole idea about being the best version of myself, but whatever I have, I'm going to share. I'm going to share with others. Like I'm not going to keep away knowledge from others. Right, this is how it happens, and when, when people look at you and and you duplicate, actually you duplicate people, they become like you, in that way, right? Everybody profits, and people like you because again, you you play the game but a communal type of way. So although the system that we see is not necessarily designed for that in in, in terms of okay, me going to college or university, whatever you want to call it. But we, we have to agree that it, it is a worldly system. So again, I think it boils down to the question of who am I? So am I a Christian that lives in the world that will be the best version of myself and at the same time I will help the other? Or am I going to be a Christian, a so-called Christian in the world that will adopt the morality of others and play their game? Does that mean that sometimes I might suffer loss? If I play the Christian way, yes, on earth, but I will gain in heaven. So who, who am I, right? So, so the idea of the last will be first. The mm. idea of giving, like where, where's Matthew 5, 6, 7, right? So, so am I seeking Christianity or am I, am I seeking wealth on earth? So if that's my objective, wealth on earth, yeah, then I might give myself, you know, or give in to, to all of these things. And that, that, that I'm losing. Because at the end of the day, what is it that I will I take with me in heaven? Well, let, let's be frank. So, so we want to speak, like you want to speak truth? Let's speak truth. So our faith tells us that there's one thing that we will take in heaven. And that is our souls. We will not take gold, silver, homes, even family. We're not going to take anything. Diplomas, certificates. Diplomas, yeah. yeah all the stuff that we speak about. Business we, cards. Right? So, so if, 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 my <laughs> focus, if my focus is this world, okay, but, but I, I'm missing out and it's just not real Christianity. Can, so, I, can I share something? Because I think mm -hmm. as soon as you had referenced this idea of the last will be first, two of the disciples at some point yeah. in time thought to themselves all we know is the game yeah so let's ask the lord to help us win at this game so two brothers james and john they walk up to christ and what do they say lord um listen like we don't want to be average we want to be above average one of us has got to be on your right the other's got to be on your left and what does the lord do as lovingly as humbly as possible he tells them instantaneously we're not playing games this is not how it works and then when their brothers find out that they actually had the audacity to ask that question, the other 10 are like, what are you doing? They're pissed. <laughs> of course, they're naturally yeah. upset, right? And so then the Lord tells them, you, you're not getting it. You're not understanding. The games that you play here are not the games that I'm interested in. So I, I could not possibly echo any more what Father has already said. It's so important to understand that as soon as you use the language of but there's a game that has to be played. No, you can you can choose to opt out of that game and oh, yeah. still be ambitious for Sorry, the game. I have to comment. I have to comment because because you know if you extend that to 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 certain traditions in the church, when when John and James are asking to be first on the right and left hand of Christ, you know there is a tradition, regardless if it's true or not, that who is sitting on the right and left hand of Christ is, is what we see in who we see in the iconostasis. That's yes, right, the Holy Mother. St. Mary, right? Yeah. Mother of God, and St. John the Baptist. The Baptist. Who are these people? <laughs> the most humble <laughs> people, the most obedient people, the ones that risk their lives. So if I'm Christian, I'm Christian. Okay, so one more time, I'm going to be annoying. Actually, I'm going to be annoying a lot, but just one more I'm not sure you can help it, but keep <laughs> yeah, going. I can't help it. We love you for it. More love this work. <laughs> uh, uh. The mother that comes up to you after their liturgy. Yeah. She tells you, my son is too nice. He can't get far mm. in life. He's too nice. People are stepping on him. Yeah. And he's so kind. <laughs> and this is what's happening every time they step on him and they step on him. What is your answer? And that's a totally different story. Um, so, so to be able to give the other cheek and, and all of these verses, you have to be a, a fully formed person. Meaning, 
I, I have to be uh, essentially an adult uh, that, that, that knows himself and therefore is capable of giving himself the other. It's something that is done by choice, not by force. If a kid goes and beats up a kid or swears at a kid or takes advantage of a kid, like we, we never promote the kid to let, allow, let himself be taken advantage of. We don't, no, no, no. Like we, we're not going to play their game, but you defend yourself. Okay, that's right? the, so, the little kid. Mm. The, grown man. It's an older mother and she's coming okay. at work. He doesn't get his promotions because he refuses to speak about his car and they talk about him and he's very humble. And is your answer going to be like, and so what? He has the kingdom? Or, but, Yanni, at but, what point are we saying, no, you, you must engage. So do you, do you not think that God blesses? Of course he blesses. Okay, so, so, so he does bless. So God is an active you know, member in, in this relationship and he does bless our life. So, I mean, I personally, before the priesthood, I've seen it many times and I'm sure Father Anthony is the same thing, if not even more, how, how your supervisors and whatnot, you, you would see things that you, you don't even think that they, they look at you and see. They see your faithfulness because Christians are faithful. They might be humble. Yeah, that's not a bad thing. But they're faithful. They work hard. They, they want to get things done right. When they help. So when my, my boss looks at me or one of, like Father Anthony's boss or you, whomever, right? And they see, wow, this guy is faithful. And this guy helps the other. And this guy trains, although we didn't ask him to train. What did they think that they're going to do? Promote him. This guy is an excellent manager. This guy is an excellent leader. Right? Again, whether this is my objective or not, as I do it, regardless, right? But as long as my heart is in heaven. But let us not think that Christianity will make us, you know, like the scum of the earth type of thing. I know never going to go anywhere. It's not true. Because people look, look at this and appreciate what they see. Actually, funny enough, like when in my previous work, we were five, six Coptic Orthodox people. Mm. I, I, and, and we did things the Christian way as best we know how. And people got to know about the Coptic Orthodox Church for those people. Look at them. These guys don't lie. They're honest. They're faithful. <clears throat> and, and, and some got promoted. Some got ordained. Right? So, I think a big part of the problem when we have these kind of conversations is that people will literally position the problem as if, unless I play There's the game, no other solution. unless I play the game, I'm not going to eat. I'm going to be on the street, which, which is completely ridiculous. That's not what's going to happen. You're right. You might not become the CEO, the CFO. You might not become, you know, this multi-billionaire. Sure, no problem. And to that, we would have absolutely no problem as followers of Christ and followers of the gospel to say, who cares if you're not those things, mm -hmm. right? That's all things law. Well, we should be able to say that. Because let me, let me position your question back at you, but differently. If your child, as a teenager, comes to you and says, that I have this group of people who at school, who they're really popular, they got a lot of power, they're really like, they are the clique. And I, and I want to be part of their crew, and they told me, no problem, but you got to start swearing the way that we swear. And here I'm just talking about swearing. I'm not even talking about stealing. I'm not talking about them committing any crimes. They just want me to be able to like speak in a way that's a little bit more aggressive so I can fit in. What do you think I should do then? So why is it so easy for us to come to the conclusion of no, don't sell your soul out for something so silly. You don't have to be part of the clique. Why are we willing to do it for 20 grand a year? Why are we willing to do it to get just one extra digit on our bankroll? Why is it so important for me to hit that position where now I'm considered senior management, where I can get that parking spot, where I can get that extra week of vacation, and that's where I'm willing to sell my soul just a little bit and hide behind the idea of, but this is the way of the world, right? At least I'm not doing A, B, and C, and then I name the worst kind of sins. At least I'm not a murderer. At least I'm not a thief. Okay, but you're, you're, you're still not faithful. The Christian ambition is not one where you begin sentences with at least. The Christian ambition is where you could say, what I want to be part of is those who are at most, not at least. And what happens when your colleague knows that you're Christian and then he knows that you backstabbed him to get a promotion? 
<laughs> like what what happens to Christ yeah, in Christ's name, right? Mm. Stepped on. Yeah. Mm. Okay, I'm gonna veer away into something that is very difficult to answer, and I'm mm-hmm. gonna be annoying again, but excess. Okay, because we're talking about ambition, and we're going to luxury. Mm-hmm. What is excess, and who is the arbiter? What is too much world to live? But while you're thinking, while you're thinking. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we're not doing product placement, but is excess a car that is such and such a price? Is excess a watch that costs so much? I'm trying not to, you know, put brands into this and so, you know, make make issues. But is excess uh, sunglasses? Uh, is excess uh, the kind of shoes? The kind of who? What is excess? Because this is the age old question of it's all relative. But there has to be a point where it's not relative anymore. So let me give you uh, an answer that uh, is going to really mess people up. Mm. We like messing people. Good. Saint Basil, mm. uh, Bishop of uh, Cappadocia. Don't say it. The one I have to. This is like this. This don't, don't say it. This made me fall <laughs> backwards when I read this for the first time. Ugh. It made me feel like I haven't even begun to understand the gospel. Mm. St. Basil, uh, he's a very big advocate for the poor. Very big advocate. He says, you are a thief if you have an extra pair of shoes you haven't worn and they're hanging out in your closet while your brother is out in the streets barefoot. To him, that is enough to merit me the title of I am stealing, I am a thief. That is excess. Okay. Let's go ahead and suggest that that's a little bit too extreme, not properly balanced. St. Basil was a monastic. He ended up dying actually very young uh, at the level of his age because he, like, he was so ascetic in his approach. Okay, he's an extremist. So be it. We're getting ready for the fight now. Just, uh, no, I'm just kidding. But let's, right. let's, let's, yeah. let's talk about someone else for just a second. Mm-hmm. My namesake is St. Anthony. Okay? We all love St. Anthony. St. Anthony, we all love him. Nobody wants to be like him though. Because as soon as St. Anthony heard the words of the gospel, if you want to be perfect, he said, I want to be perfect. I want to be perfect. And so what does he do? He sets himself up to make sure that his sister is taken care of and he pours out any form of excess into her. He has no problem directing excess towards his sister. He makes sure that she is taken care of, that she is put into a community, that she has funds to make sure that she can survive. And not only survive, but live well. He takes all the rest gives it to the poor excessively. All excess is pointed towards the other, not towards the self. And where does he want excess? There's this beautiful passage in the life of St. Anthony. Hmm. St. Athanasius describes him as a bee that would go from one flower Hmm. to another, collecting its nectar. Why? What was he doing? Before he went into the wilderness, St. Anthony lived among a community of ascetics that lived on the outskirts of the city. So there was already this idea of people living an ascetic life, but they weren't monastics because they weren't yet out into the wilderness. They were living on the outskirts of the cities. He would go from one elder to another. From this one, he would live with him and be discipled to him to learn patience. And once once he mastered patience, he'd go to the next one. From that next one, he learned what it was to be compassionate and loving. Once he mastered it, he'd move on to the next one. He said he would move around from one person to another, collecting this nectar as if he was a bee. Why? What's the, what's the mentality? So to the extent where St. Athanasius actually describes this in the biography and he says, they all looked at him and gave him the title of what? Philotheos. Him who loves God. Why would they give that title to a young man? Why wouldn't they be annoyed at this like ambitious young man who all he wants to do is one-up everyone? Why did they see something in him that was beautiful? All he wanted to do was adorn himself with virtues so that as a bride, To the bridegroom, he may be able to offer the best that he could possibly give. Excess can apply at the level of virtue when it's directed to the self. Directed to others, no problem. Pour out excess into them. So, when you're really tempted (laughs) to be, forget, I I can't believe I'm going to reference Andrew Tate. When you want to be the top G and all you want is to have the Bugatti and all you want is to have the Rolex, right? I'm very, 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 very sorry. That is simply not Christian. You pouring out that kind of money for the sake of you being able to say, look at what I possess, Mm -hmm. look at me, 
This is the exact same vehicle that will get you from point A to point B, and you're going to follow the traffic signals just like everyone else. That watch that you look at that you're so happy is in the six digits, close to half a mil, if not more. <laughs> it's going to give you the exact same time Correct. as every other watch. Excess here is entirely sinful. And right, you'll be right. next to each other in the tomb, both of you. But, but, but I, I, I have but, seen you holding yourself, no, but it's not and you that. want to scream. So let, let, <laughs> yes, let, okay. let me, you know, let, let let me get all out, and no, then no. I'll have forgotten. So, and then, so, okay, go ahead. So Father Anthony, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, like, has the perfect answer uh, for those that can take that answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So, so <laughs> and, and it's it's a perfect answer. And I, I have think to go home and burn all my shoes. I, I, th yeah. I think <laughs> this is <laughs> given the I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I think we all like need to take steps towards this. Um, but for those that, you know, their ears are itching, <laughs> they get, like, if I can mellow it down a bit, because St. Beasel no, also great. says stuff like, he says like, you know, anyways, I like it's, it's great. Says, and, and sorry to interrupt yeah. you, I'm gonna let you finish before I, before I, I go back at Father, because I'm not gonna let him get away he, just that fast. Yeah, but, I'm trying to defend we're, him. Yeah. We're doing a podcast for people that are on their phones or laptops, mm -hmm. all of which cost thousands of dollars sure. to go on social media to watch, right, and be edified. Mm -hmm. And we can label any of the things I just said as excess. So yes, I, yes, yes. And who all that, have closets that are filled no, 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 with no, that, it's 15 not, to 20 pairs of shoes. That's not the point. That the point are is not unnecessary. Judgment. The point is, is, is what, what you're saying is lovely. And I'm going to let Father go. And, and God grant us, honestly, God grant us to lift. I would love one day yeah. to God. Grant me that ability to say, I, I don't need more than one shirt, one pair of pants, yes, one. Yes, yes. But, but let's be realistic to people who just want the next step because this is not. Okay. So this is, this is for I those who even, seek the yeah. life of, of perfection. I, and I think we, we cannot dilute that. I, I think, including myself, I should be seeking that life more and more, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think the answer is great. Um, but, but many of us are maybe not able to even desire this life of perfection, li living in the West and whatnot. Um, I, I can't tell you a number and a price and all these things. It's nonsense, right? And also, you know, you know, but I can tell you maybe concepts that could potentially help. Um, and also, like, we have to understand context. Like, so, so St. Basil, St. Basil was, like, at this point, there was a famine going on, mm. right? So, 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 so we have to also understand that. So St. Basil sees a famine going on and, and the poor, sorry, the rich, are keeping the money and they're not giving to the poor. He's freaking out and he's blasting them full force and he has mm. the entire right to do so. And he says, even, he says crazier things even, right? Um, but I, I think, you know, if ever we would make it a point for us to remember a bit more the poor, I think we would do better. What do I mean by this? You know, if I look at, you know, again, the rich man and Lazarus, not every one of us would say, of course, if I had a beggar on my door on a daily basis, I'll give him food. Of course. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not a big feat. I think, I think anybody would do that, right? But, but the problem is that because we live in the West, we don't see the real poverty that exists in the world. Asia, Africa, like Egypt, like you name it, right? So we, we don't see it. So what happens? We forget. And I'm the first one to forget. So, so I see Paul, I see Father Anthony, I see whomever, like we see people in church, you know, we have this type of car, okay. It doesn't mean that we have the, the, the best types of car, but like, I mean, whatever, right? So you see things and you just do, right? You just imitate. But if we would think a bit more about those people that do exist, I think things would be a bit different. So, you know how, so how sometimes we go, uh, in, like let's say a poor village in, in any poor country, like imagine going to a poor village where people that are, are really poor, what do we usually do? Do we dress up, do we go with a thousand dollar suit type of thing? No, right? You go with clothes that fits them. You sleep like them, you eat like them, right? So I think that same idea is that we have to remember that those people exist. And, and by doing so, maybe I can just, as, as a practice, help myself a bit not to be attached to things, meaning. Um, let's say I want to buy a, a dining table. Okay, and I, I'm going and I'm shopping for one, and, and I see one that costs three hundred dollars. Nothing costs three hundred dollars anymore, but whatever. Okay, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. three hundred dollars, right? 
And then I see another one that costs a thousand dollars. I like it a bit more, right? But I like the one with three hundred dollars very well before seeing this one. So it would be a good practice, I would think, for us to 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 maybe consider. You know what? Maybe I don't need a thousand dollars. All I can afford that table. Maybe I don't need it. Maybe I can buy that one or three hundred dollars. But since I'm ready to expend that extra seven hundred, maybe I should give that to the poor. Maybe I should remember that this exists. So again, I don't need um, to seek the best of the best when it comes to material things. I, I think that would be a, a proper good step forward um, for most of us with the hopes of attaining what Father Anthony is speaking of. Mm -hmm. And forgive me, the, the point was not to be contentious, but really, because I, I know people are going to be screaming at whatever they're watching on and saying, but that's not what we're talking about. And we're not talking about the yacht or the Rolex or the unattainable, you know, Rolls Royce that costs a million dollars. Mm -hmm. But what is the practical too much is what, I, is what I mean. Like someone who wants an actual spiritual, you know, give me a spiritual teaching, but also like a training, okay? Mm -hmm. Where I tell you, Father, forget roller start, like You know, clothing and, and shoes and all that, that's all we can talk about that. I don't know how edifying it is. What's the point? How do I find the point in my life where it becomes excess. So, um, we did this exercise once. Because it's all, we can agree it's relative, right? Like, someone who's worth a billion dollars, a True. Rolex is like a Timex for, for, for you and me, right? It's, it's relative in comparison to the fact that you're already at a category where everything about you is excessive. It's not relative in comparison to how much it costs to be able to feed a single person who's hungry. And this is where I think we have a problem. We think the standard moves up with us. The cost of what it's like for us to be Christian and to help those who are in need, like, forgive me, the, the, it, let's use Father's example for just a second. The $700 that you're willing to put on that table because this table is prettier, mm -hmm. right? That $700 when you're a billionaire or with that $700 when you're the average person who's making a decent salary mm -hmm. is still the exact same worth when it comes to what it's going to do for those who have nothing. And while I respect tremendously the fact that Father brought up this idea of us doing mission and visiting places that were like truly the, ma the majority of the population is in poverty, you don't have to go very far. Go downtown. Mm -hmm. Go downtown today and you're going to see people who anywhere and everywhere, they do not have the luxury that you have. So to go back to your question, what does this look like practically? Begin to teach your children from the youngest of age that if they have a mm -hmm. basement that is filled with toys, Mm -hmm. They have a basement that is filled with toys. If you tell your children, on your birthday, you're getting new toys. Grandpa, grandma, your aunts, your uncles, your cousins, everyone's going to buy you new toys because it's your birthday. Here's what we're going to do. For every new toy that you receive, I want you to go through that entire closet or those bins of toys that you have. Identify toys that you haven't played with. And we're going to go and give them to Salvation Army. We're going to go give them to a shelter that has children. And that way on your birthday, we're going to make room for the new toys that you get. What are you teaching your child? There is no reason to hoard toys. There is no reason to collect for the sake of collecting. I would encourage us as adults to do the same. You want to go buy yourself a new pair of shoes. Wonderful. I'm not saying don't buy it. But as you buy that one, go identify two pairs of shoes that you haven't worn in the last year and go give that to people who need it. Now we're going to sit there and say, but Father, you know that that's not easy. That's not very practical. No, it's super practical. No, what that hurts us? Super practical. But you'd be him. surprised. No, that because was the average person today feels like unless I have six pairs of Jordans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, that one's super practical. But that that in itself has another problem: is that I must have the newest, and you know that has its own issues. But that's not even my question. I, and I don't, maybe I'm not just, I'm doing, I'm not doing a good job communicating it because it, it's, it is a sensitive issue. But my question is more so along the lines of there are many cars that can take me from A to B. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. You're telling me get the one, you know, that can get me there for the least amount. That would be the, the spiritual, you know what I mean? That that's the spiritual lesson. Any shoe I could put on, there are many shoes that could be comfortable. You're telling me don't get the brand named one that I, 
but I don't know that that's is that really the 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 idea yeah. here? Is that what we're going for? So because so, so I, I I thought sorry, but I I think we we like we have to understand that it's not uh and one answer fit all type of mm -hmm. thing, right? So we are all of us at different levels in our spiritual lives. Mm -hmm. All of us, uh, some of us are willing to to walk much more towards the the idea of per perfection than, than others. So I think it's good for everyone to take a step forward. Um, some people, you know, they, they might see, well, I live in the West, I have to buy this and that, whatever. You, you, you don't have to buy anything. But as long as you are doing a small sacrifice, at least, you're taking a step forward, I think you're on the right track. And that's what I was trying to do with this example mm -hmm. and the $700. So, and, and I, I really apologize for the next question. And I... There was no heads up for this question, so I just want to say it. Is this continuing the same conversation? Since, yes. Okay, because yes. I asked. Yeah. Okay. I, you visit abroad historical places. You go into cathedrals mm. and church with beauty and gold, and and mm -hmm. this is a question people ask. So mm -hmm. yeah. I don't want us to shy around it. And mm -hmm. forgive me because I know you're a priest. We spend lots of money on our churches, the beauty, and it is for God's glory, and I get it. But the same kind of argument can be had in terms of simplicity and humility and, and, and purpose. So can we kind of shed some light on, on, on that answer? Because people have it and they say, why? Why these giant you know, buildings and cathedrals and beauty and shouldn't be simplicity, shouldn't be the, the easiest, you know, most common denominator to get people to, to pray? Hmm. Yes, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. So let's go back to that idea of if excess will ever be tolerated, it must be directed outside towards another, not towards yourself. When the church decides that it's going to decorate its churches so that it could be worthy of what it means for us to have a house of prayer, a house that belongs to God, this is one of the means by which the church intends to be able to bring glory to God's name. But let me be very clear. If the church in any form is strictly focused on the walls, on the beauty, on what's gold-plated, yeah. and in the process is not taking care of the beggar that's at the door, we of all people will be most condemned. St. John Chrysostom says, if you cannot find Christ in the beggar that's outside of the church, you will not find him in the chalice. If the church does not have an incarnational approach to this, so I, I know for a fact that there are so many of our fathers, the bishops and the metropolitans that encourage every single one of their own churches to be tithing. People don't know this. People don't understand this concept. Yes, so please explain it because that's, that's a common question. People ask. The church her, herself, while she is sustained by the generosity and the donations of her own congregation members, she also has a responsibility to tithe. So if my church, I'm going to use round numbers because it's easy. If my church ends up bringing in a thousand dollars this year, obviously that is a gross exaggeration, mm -hmm. okay? Then the church is responsible to take 10% of what was given to her to make sure all of the services are properly maintained, the buildings are taken care of, that we take care of the poor who are among our people. But there is 10% of that that also needs to be given to others. The church herself lives out the process of being obedient to the commandment of tithing. And all of this should be done in light of what it means for us to care for God and to care for neighbor. But if you see the church pouring that out on herself, as if there is the intention of making the clergy members look healthy, wealthy, successful, rich people, then this is where you know that something has gone wrong. If you visit the churches or the monasteries, they're falling apart. You, you go visit these monasteries and there's nothing fancy about them. Mm -hmm. And if there is something fancy, it's, it's the room that's meant for hospitality where we greet the guests. Mm -hmm. It is definitely not the cells of the monks. Mm -hmm. If you take a look at where, how the priests live in general across the church, mm -hmm. no, nobody's rocking a Bentley. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's not going to happen. Yeah. Uh, I mean, but also let's admit it. Do, do people sometimes make mistakes? Yeah, people sometimes make mistakes, but but the Orthodox. Who are you referring to? Like, <laughs> like no, but not churches. Please. Yeah, churches. Like, do churches make mistakes? 
of course Jewish mystics is 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 a bishop uh, always necessarily spiritual is a priest always necessarily spiritual no there's always a judas around sure so so i mean but let's not confuse uh these mistakes with the orthodox understanding of my responsibility towards the other when it comes to wealth and in terms in terms of dimension the church well, the, the church has to be able to be big enough to host the people that are coming to worship um i don't know if you're done with this question but i just wanted to say something mm -hmm. about about the former question about all all these things about how we we need to be better in, in giving to the poor I, I just wanted to send a message maybe to those who feel bad mm -hmm. about stuff. um uh maybe feeling bad about uh, buying a big house or whatever a car I mean, it doesn't matter what you've done. What will matter is, is what you will do. I, I have seen, at least in my life, as a youth, as a kid, even as an adult, uh, we haven't been speaking about these things, right? And that's why like, we, we thank you very much, actually, to, to bring up that subject, because it, it is very much needed. And it's even after the priesthood that I started like, reading the stuff and like, I'm like, what? Like I've done so many mistakes in my life, you know? So, so if I've done so many mistakes in my life and I'm somehow wearing black by the grace of God, which I think, um, you know, I don't know why he gave me that grace. I, I don't deserve it. Um, so I, I, think, I think we're fine. Like, I mean, but looking towards the future, uh, let us try to be a bit more simple. Let us try to, to give a bit more to the poor. Uh, and forget about the past. God grant us that. <coughs> okay, uh, a concept that I really wanted to, you know, get some enlightenment on is contentment. We always want to, you know, godliness with contentment is great gain. The concept of being content. Can you give us the best way to approach it, to achieve it, because like you said, we're all at different levels, you know, but we've seen the richest of the rich never be content, and we've mm. seen the poorest of the poor be content. Yeah. So what is that key that unlocks that door? Mm. I think the number one contender or the number one enemy for contentment is FOMO. Mm. The idea of being plagued with the fear of missing out so you just you gave a an example of this just a few minutes ago i already have iphone 84. <laughs> i don't know where we're at but uh and then six months after buying 84 they come out with 85 and now you know it's the exact same phone but it's got another camera it's two millimeters bigger father my bad uh, yeah. I, uh, clearly i don't yeah <laughs> and here i am dying dying over the fact that mm. I, I can't, I can't. Th this thing now is a representation of how I am not up to date. We let material things dictate the status that we want people to see us at. So if I don't live in that neighborhood, if I have not yet, you know, <laughs> bought this very specific brand of car, if, if I'm not vacationing at these very specific locations, there can never be an opportunity where we are finally content and thankful for what we have. One of the litanies that we pray in the church, we pray for the air of heaven, the fruits of the earth, the rising of the waters of the rivers. And at some point we're talking about how it is that we ask the Lord to be able to raise all of these things to their measures, right? And we say, fill our hearts with joy and gladness, that we too, having sufficiency in all things. What does that mean? We have sufficiency in all things. We have what we need. Precisely. At, at some point, you have to be asking yourself the question, why do I desire so badly to purchase this new thing, to unlock this new level, whatever that may be? At some point, we're going to come to the conclusion that it really has nothing to do with need. I am satisfied. I have all that I need. Now it just becomes what I want to be able to dabble in what I want. And I think that is what causes issues when it comes to us not being content. Where, like, I mean, God, especially in the Western world, has, has blessed us to be at a point compared to other areas in the world where we have what we need 
a long time ago. You know what I mean? Like uh, compared to the poverty rate in the world and the sheer number of people that, you know, don't even have the basic necessities of life, the clean water, the food, the but people here are saying that okay, I have let's say I have what I need. I'm not I'm not starving, I'm not on the street like you're saying earlier, but I can still strive to have more or to earn more or to get more or whatever it be. At wit like even Abraham is not gonna stop shepherding his sheep and growing and, and having offspring to his sheep and you know what I mean? At at which point like d- is it a halting of no. everything for spirituality, that's contentment? No. Or is it a contentment has everything to do with the fact that you're not pursuing something more? Contentment is Abraham being faithful to the fact that he's shepherding his sheep and he's not trying to say, Oh, I'm at four thousand, let's go for five. Mm-hmm. That's a lack of contentment. Him faithfully shepherding his four thousand. Mm-hmm. By the way, I'm coming up with these numbers. I don't even yeah. know what the reference is, okay? <laughs> but me being content in my job, I'm very happy that I'm making X amount of dollars a year. That's me being content. Mm -hmm. But me continuing to be faithful and hardworking and being present and a good colleague and a good employee, if that eventually unlocks something more, by all means, take it as a gift from God. Mm -hmm. We're not saying don't take it because if you take it, you're not content. But when you, the moment you unlock the next level, the very next day, you're like, okay, let's go for one more. Mm-hmm. That's not contentment. But why would we assume that that these things will give us contentment? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even I don't even understand that. But mm-hmm. do, do I, I, I also understood yeah. contentment as, as like a concept in terms of like an earthly, because you're never mm-hmm. going to be content spiritually, because you should always be striving for more. Correct? Uh, like, correct. Well, Christ is the one that will make us content. So, so, so our content. I, Think of it as satisfaction. Is that not what am I mistaken? Yeah, yeah. No, yes, yeah, the same, mm-hmm. same. But but what will make my soul satisfied? It is not things. It's just not. Mm-hmm. It's not a relationship. It's not a food that I eat or a dessert mm-hmm. or this couch or the, none of this stuff will make us content. It might make me happy somewhat for 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 a couple of months or whatnot, depending on the thing that I bought. But but contentment will never come from this. Like you mentioned it earlier, like this poor person in Egypt that is illiterate that has nothing yet content in Christ. So right? what's Saint Paul says? Godliness with contentment is great gain. What's what is he telling us to do? Is my question. Godliness with contentment is great gain. So where is the material portion in this verse? Like I don't know. I don't know. Where, where, where is the? Material? What does he mean? Uh, but mm. that, that's what I mean. Like I mean, because because I can be content in my suffering, I, I can mm. be content in my poverty, I can be content in so many things. It doesn't have to be material. The material will never give me contentment. I'm looking at the wrong thing. So is, the, is it, so it's just a, a, a constant state of thankfulness, regardless. Yeah. Is that what contentment is? Yeah, yeah. That, that that Christ is the one that will give us this contentment and the satisfaction. Mm-hmm. Like, like Father Anthony was saying, like I can always go to the next level, but what is that gonna do? Mm-hmm. It's never, never, ever gonna give me contentment. There's a saying that says, uh, "It's not a Christian saying per se." That talks about real wealth is when, not when you possess all things. Yeah, but when you are in need of nothing, mm-hmm. absolutely contentment. Mm-hmm. Contentment is when you decide to turn to Christ and say, "You are my everything." Yeah. Mm-hmm. We say we say it literally in the litany of the gospel. We talk about how it is that you are the hope of us all, the healing of us all, the resurrection of us all, the salvation of us all. You are my everything. So for that woman in Egypt who lives in complete poverty but is filled with joy, she has made Jesus her everything. Do you come and tell her? Mom, I have a donation for you of X amount. She's not, she's not moved in any way. Thank you so much. Give it to someone who needs yeah. it. We, yes, we've, we've, yes. we've met people like this, I promise you, in the streets yeah. of Ottawa where I serve. People who literally, like, they are in need of nothing now that they have Christ. And they are much wealthier than me. Those are the real rich people because they need nothing. You can have a billion dollars in a bank account, but you're always in need. Who's the poor person? Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Like that, that that's the idea. Mm. Okay, I'll you know, take us now another road that you're gonna find annoying a little bit. Um, <laughs> why is there such a stark contrast between the old testament? 
we get to the New Testament, it's about simplicity and about poverty and about humility, and and, and that's and great. But the legends of the Old Testaments are the Solomons of the world, the Davids whose coffers of gold he wants to show, you know, to the world, mm-hmm. whose conquered nations, the Abrahams, the Jacobs, who even in you know through deception, but became you know a father of nations. The Moses who became, you know, Prince of Egypt almost, but that's like a more cartoon than anything. But like, I call him Prince of Egypt, but, you know, <laughs> became so rich and a savior to yeah. to his people, right? Like wealth and prosperity in the Old Testament. God wanted to show someone that, it, it, you know, was, was worthy of righteousness it's through wealth, through, you know, being great. But that's not so after Jesus comes. So are, are the laws of the Old Testament or God's commandments in the Old Testament the same as the New Testament? No, they're not, right? And you are told, you know, an eye for an eye, a for tooth. now I tell you, give, get the cheek, right? So, so God changed completely the laws. Why is that? So what, what's the difference between the Old and New Testament? It's the incarnation of Christ. And his salvific work, right? And through it, he indwells the Holy Spirit in us. So there's a completely, uh, there's a huge difference between how people live in the West and the Old Testament, sorry, and in the New Testament. It's a completely different life. So even sometimes we, we, we think that the saints are, are equal. Like, oh, like, I don't know, King David or, or, or little prophet Samuel, whomever. Right, are like uh, as great, for example, as the saints of the New Testament. They're, they're not. But Father, forgive me to cut you off. Like David, the prophet and king, the psalmist, like every saint yeah. in the New Testament uses the words of David, you know, the psalmist as, you know, the words to speak and to pray to God, I, yet was so rich but, but and, the, but and the, so. Yet David, with all like these psalms, was the Holy Spirit indwelling in him. We can like, say, I mean, the, like the, in the New Testament, but the Bible tells us a man after God's own heart. Yeah, he he, he, he not... was, and you can see Abraham. Abraham is very New Testamentish, if you want, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like you can see humility, faith in him. But did the Holy Spirit indwell Abraham, like the Holy Spirit would indwell? Whomever, said Anthony, even myself for yourself. No. Christ came to save humanity. What does that mean? He, mean? he came to heal humanity. And he came to give humans the power through him. He gives power to us to do things that were not necessarily possible in the Old Testament. So we're comparing apples and oranges. Christ transformed everything. Christianity is not like Judaism. They're different. So the question is, how did Christ live? And then what did he tell me to do? So did Christ tell David to do so? No, because David was in the Old Testament and God gave him different laws. So why was there different laws given to David and Moses and, and the prophets and whatnot? It's because their humanity was different. They were not capable of performing what we are capable of today. And the difference is the incarnation of Christ. And the other side of the coin is that they were not able to live life, spiritual life, as we do today. They did not have access to what we have access to. The kingdom of God was at hand during the time of Christ on earth. The kingdom of God is within right now. The kingdom of God was very far in the Old Testament, right? So, so it's a completely different ballgame. I think there's also, there's something to be said about how it is that you, you, you're definitely not wrong in saying that in the context of the Old Testament, when the Lord is building up the nation of Israel so that he may work out his salvific work in the arrival of the Messiah, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he does use the capacities of those very wealthy people to mm. build the nation. Right, and he makes sure that the kings are prosperous, and he stands with Israel as long as Israel is faithful. I mean, you take a look at a person like Abraham. Abraham was not led by his wealth; he didn't spare any of his belongings 
when it comes to offering to God, he didn't even spare Isaac. He was willing to give him up. Mm -hmm. The same thing for David. David did not live a comfortable, cushy life because he was wealthy. On the contrary, because of his sin, there was war, there was turmoil. He was constantly at battle. But look at the person who, for instance, you named him. Solomon who gets comfortable and his wealth becomes his number one, like his right arm. Look at what he writes about wealth in the book of Proverbs, in the book of Ecclesiastes. Vanity of vanity, all is vanity, all of it. So you're right in saying the Lord does allow for that wealth, but never, nowhere will you see in the Old Testament a contradiction that the Lord is trying to say that in the Old Testament wealth is good, and then in the New Testament he says wealth is bad. He's constantly saying throughout the entire message of Scripture, I am your treasure. Mm -hmm. And I, in that case, I don't think, or in that, from that perspective, I don't think there's contradiction. So that brings us to the next question, because there's still different, I don't know if you want to call it sects of Christianity or factions or whatever it be, that have this whole basis of a prosperity gospel. Mm. That God has chosen us, so he makes us extremely wealthy. And uh, this is God's way of showing his you know, glory on earth. What is our belief or our answer? What are the dangers of this in the first place? So the prosperity gospel, for those who are not familiar with what it is that you're referring to, is the idea that there are Christians among us today in the Western world specifically, who will promote the idea that the message of the gospel is that the Lord wants you to be healthy, wealthy, successful, prosperous, and that he wants to give you all of these things as long as you buy my new book, as long as you <laughs> donate to my cause, as long as you buy this holy water that I blessed here on TV. Um, and this, this, is a, this is a movement that many Christians today more and more are condemning to be. Mm. And let me just call it out for what it is. It's, an, it's demonic. You are literally name dropping Jesus for the sake of lining your pockets with other people's money. You are telling people God wants you to be healthy. He wants you to be wealthy. He wants you to be successful. And the only way you're going to do that is if you buy my merch. If you come to my mega church, this is ridiculous. Where, where in the gospel does it say this? When he says, carry your cross and follow me. When he tells his own disciples, because they have hated me, they will hate you. Mm -hmm. Where is the comfort in this? Any gospel that preaches anything other than the denial of self, the carrying of the cross, the following him to glory, allowing for the crucifixion that we may see resurrection, this is the message of our gospel. Anybody who says, no, on the contrary, God wants to make you comfortable. He wants to make you super rich. He wants to make you successful. If you have any form of illness in you, it is because you are displeasing to God. Maybe what will please God is if you give more to the church. And here we have these preachers who like, they have private jets. Mm -hmm. They live in mansions that are like 20, 30, 40 million dollars. It makes absolutely no sense. This to us, is very much a sentiment that is, with every meaning of the definition, it is anti-Christ. It does not line up with the gospel. Was Christ wealthy? Oh my goodness. Was Christ healthy? He was, but did he not give up his life for me and you? Mm -hmm. Was Christ loved? Right. So, so if Christ himself did not live that type of life and we ought to walk yeah. in his footsteps. So what is this about? Even the fathers that came after, I, I'm always surprised that these people come up with these new things. I'm like, there's 2,000 years of, you know, great church fathers and mothers that came before you. Yeah. And none of them had this message. Yeah. It's, where does it, you know? So, true story. Mm -hmm. St. John Chrysostom. I like him a lot, especially mm -hmm. on the subject of mm -hmm. excess and luxury and ambition and stuff. Um, he is now named the Patriarch of Constantinople. And the very wealthy of that mm. major city, one thing that they were in the habit of doing is getting custom chalices made with emeralds and diamonds and rubies, right? And made out of pure gold. And they would offer it to the major cathedral so that, you know, what ends up happening is we can say among our friends, oh, the patriarch prayed with our chalice, mm -hmm. this feast, right? <laughs> he walks into the cathedral palace, which is basically just a fancy word to be able to say where the patriarch lives opens up the closets, and he literally takes all of those clothings that were purchased by rich people and donated to the patriarch, 
and he starts throwing them out the windows. He empties out the, those cupboards that were filled with the chalices and he starts giving them out to the poor to the point where people were complaining and saying, there's beggars on the street running around with the patriarch's clothing, right? And when they complained and they said, what are you doing with our donations? He's like, you want me to keep them locked up in closets? When the Lord's brothers mm -hmm. are running around and they have nothing to eat. So again, this idea of the church saying, give to us that we may be rich was never, ever anything that we found in the early church. So to your point, mm -hmm. if you just study the history and the tradition of the early church. One last argument, if you can just answer to it is, um, some of these prosperity gospel yeah. you know participants their main argument is well i bring glory to god because people see me wealthy they see my private jet they see my whatever it be my bugatti and they say wow so rich uh, because he's pleased god and they come to christ because they've brought glory to god in their success right what is the answer to this argument of you know sorry how is the glory to god given here uh, followers come to Christ uh, because of their success. So they're, you know, labeling their success as a way to bring, you know, God's glory or God blesses. Look how strong our God is because he makes me successful. And so, okay. So, 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 so here the gospel, is it for everyone or, or only for those who God blesses, quote unquote? So, so, so the poor person that lives wherever God does not look God, liberal. God, God does not like that person, right? Mm -hmm. This God, this person is, is accursed from God, like right. Mm -hmm. So, so is the gospel accessible to everyone? In this case, no, it's not. Mm -hmm. so, so, how is that the good news? How, how can salvation given from God, the Creator of the entire world, be accessible only to a few? And what's the percentage of those people if you look on a worldwide scale? What is it? One percent? The Not first even, percent? Yeah. Yeah. But God frowns upon. What, what are you talking about? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the complete nonsense. What does yeah. what does Peter say when he sees the blind man at the door of the mm. temple? Golden, Golden silver, silver I don't, I don't have. have, but what, what I do I have, have I give you. And what did he have? Okay, last uh, questions before we wrap up. As a church, because we also don't want to har har harbor judgment upon people who have or don't have or whatever it be what's the way as church fathers, as a church as a whole, that we, you know, can help people approach such a sensitive subject in terms of, you know, like w where we go next for God, whether you have or you don't have, when it comes to money, how do we not become judgmental, but use that or move forward to use that in a way for God's glory as a church, as a community? whether we are all successful or not successful in the earthly world. Not sure I follow. Sorry. I'm trying to be delicate, but it's not coming no, let's, let's go for it. Let's go for it. Yeah. People, we, we don't know you to be delicate. Huh? <laughs> I know. It's true. I don't know why I'm starting now. Yeah. There are people that are very rich, okay. right? Uh, and there are people okay. who don't have. So there's yeah. a, in every community the haves and don't haves, and mm -hmm. usually they're on opposite sides of the political spectrum, whatever be spectrum. Mm -hmm. Okay? For those who don't have, what is our advice to them in terms of, you know, lack of judgment and how to approach those who do and vice versa, right? How do we bring them together? Because mm -hmm. that's been an age old problem since the beginning of time. Are you talking here in terms of, of classes the, and uh, humility and right? Mm. Social background, social status. Mm. Um. I mean, I, I think it's uh, it's fairly simple. Um, I mean, at least theoretically, when we look at the Book of Acts, how did the church function? Right, they were always like in one accord. Uh, people would give to the church, lay at the feet of the apostles, and the apostles would distribute equally. Um, this is something that can only be done um, in a church, right? if it's done properly obviously that has to be led by the holy spirit so but to keep it simple um i think the rich man ought to give a bit more to be a bit more sensitive towards his spending and uh and give to the poor whether they're locally or abroad and for the person that doesn't have as much to be content you know saint paul when he speaks even to the slaves in the new testament he tells them don't seek 
to be free. Mm. But if your owner frees you, good. Let it be, right? But again, contentment will never be in these things. Unfortunately, it is quite the opposite. The, mo the more we have, the more problems we have. The more we, are, we have a risk to be enslaved to these things. And we, like, we become like chicken without heads, running around, doing things, maintaining things. So it's not uh, necessarily a great gain for someone to be rich. Unless if the person is able to manage it properly, and, and many do, which, which is wonderful. Um, but I, I don't think you know there needs to be a more complicated uh, way of doing things that I, because um, we do not control people. The church does not control people or will to control people. You know, people have to be willing to give on their own. God loves a cheerful giver. Right? Well, but I don't even mean just about mm -hmm. giving. But are we called to? change our lifestyle even if we can afford or can whatever it be uh drive or dress or whatever it be to mesh with those who cannot is that like an actual calling is that not a duality almost or is that really is that what we're supposed to be doing it's a better way but i i will not say it's a must okay i think there are many factors that go to it but it's definitely a better way you know, like I was saying earlier, if if I go to to, to a poor country and whatnot, um, I, I would try to mimic them. You know, maybe it's not that bad of an idea. Also, that I try to to, to live a life of of cho of poverty by choice here as well. Again, but people have different capabilities, and that's fine. Like no, nobody's judging you. Nobody's like looking at the other, pointing the finger. Are oh, you rich? Because I'm poor. Like <laughs> right. And if some do, you shouldn't. You know, maybe maybe God has blessed this man with money and this man is capable or this woman is capable of dealing with money and still have her heart with God and give to others and she gives much more and you don't know about it. Maybe if you had that type of money, you would not be with God today, right? So, so we shouldn't be looking at each other and judging each other. We should look at ourselves, offer repentance, be content with God. Uh, and the rich should be encouraged to give more, while the poor should, you know, um, be a bit more content or as as much as they possibly can. And you know, maybe I'm poor because I'm not I'm being a, the lazy servant as well. Like there's many factors to that, right? So maybe I need to also uh, offer repentance in the sense that I, I need to be the best person I can be. Maybe I'm not doing that, and maybe I am. And in either case, you know, God will bring fulfillment. Any last uh, thoughts? Um, I would really like for all of the audience to uh, to revisit the way that they view the graces and the blessings that God has given them. Mm. I read a statistic, um, I think it was eight or nine years ago. It blew my mind. It said that basically if you have a net worth that is over, I think it was $400,000, which is the vast majority of our people in North America. If you own a home and a car, mm -hmm. you, you're already, you already have a worth that's almost $400,000. And this is other than what you already have saved up and what mm -hmm. you, so the vast majority of our young people who live in homes where you have two vehicles and a, you know, and, and a two car garage and you live in a home that has two stories, your, your parents are worth more than 400000 If you have more than $400,000 worth of net worth, you're already in the top 4% of the global population. Mm -hmm. So when we only compare ourselves upwards to those who are filthy rich, the millionaires and the billionaires, then yeah, you're sitting there saying, oh, Abuna's not talking about me, I'm not rich. That's not necessarily true. The Lord has blessed you abundantly. And every single one of us has something to offer. If the widow could offer two mites, then surely I have something to offer. And it's not only at the level of my money. Maybe it's at the level of what I have hiding in my closet. Maybe it's at the level of my time, my energy, my love. Maybe it's at the level of my service. But there is something to be said about how it is that the Lord has always told us, do not hide what I have given you as grace. And so maybe a big part of this conversation that we're having is that every single one of us needs to investigate 
What is it that he's given me that I'm not using, that I have taken for granted and have hidden away, almost forgotten that he's given it to me, that can be offered to my neighbor, that can be offered back to God, all to bring glory to the kingdom. The last thing I'll say is that we were created as humans to be uh, simple uh, in the sense that all our mind, our heart, our thoughts, our senses are directed towards God. And the more we do this, the better we will live, truly. Um, if I am fragmented within, in the sense that my heart is divided between heaven and earth, my heart is divided between follow God's commandments, following God's commandments and, and, and seeking worldly things. In that sense, you know, may, maybe I need to just push a bit more towards repentance and confession and really you know, forgetting that that duality and, and becoming simple again. And whatever whatever means I may have, whatever wealth I may have, um, let it be something that I use for the glory of God. Mm -hmm. But always have my heart in heaven. You know, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, right? So I, I think that verse is key. Um, and we should pray about this every day, especially for us here living in the West remembering to fulfill God's command. Forgive me, that was supposed to be the wrap-up, but I have one more because you brought it now. And I ask you this question with respect to every other topic we had, so I'm going to do it again. I, Paul, here now live in, you know, North America. I have a responsibility to my children, to my wife, but I want that. I want what you just said. I want the kingdom. I want St. Basil's, you know, one pair of shoes. I want St. Anthony's take care of the other, but, you know, just about the other, sometimes you feel like, okay, is there, is there a monastic, like you have to become almost like a, a monk to fulfill this? How does one fulfill it in the world, but also fulfill all these requirements, all these responsibilities, right? Forgive me, Father. Um, so so I, I think, um, the first distinction that must be made is what I choose to do personally versus what I impose on my family, right? So so if my wife, if I'm able to do this and I want to do this and I want to pursue it, so is my wife. So let's do it together. So my kids as well, great, because I trained them since we were young, let's do it together. But let's say my wife is not willing or say my wife is willing but not the kids, right? Then okay, like I I shouldn't impose this. I shouldn't impose perfection on anyone. So, so exactly. So without them, like without having to implicate anybody except myself. Yeah. Where does one go? There's a beautiful uh, understanding in the Christian movement that talks about how it is that you must always see yourself as third. God is first. My neighbor is second. I am a third. In all things that the Lord has given to you, make sure that you follow that order. First offer to the Lord, offer it to your neighbor, and the neighbor here is going to be your wife, your kids, your family members, the people that you serve, your community. And then from what is left over, give to yourself. So what does this look like in your own home without necessarily having implications? Your kids should not be deprived of you vacationing with them. Mm. They have the right to be able to vacation with their dad. No problem. But you don't need to take them to Bora Bora. You can have a wonderful time with them by taking them down south and going to the Caribbean and doing whatever you want, but it doesn't have to be at the $1,000 a night resort. But you can give them their vacation. And if your wife is not ready to be able to downsize and she still wants you know, the, 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 the 5,000 square foot home, tell her when you are ready. And as you pray about this, I am ready to take the next step with you. But until you are ready, we're not doing anything unless we are both aligned. I just ask you to pray with me to see where the Lord guides us. There's many ways by which you can begin doing this idea of, Lord, I will respect those that you have given to me. I will respect the freedom of my wife and my children, but I will do my very best to also make sure that none of this is directed towards selfish ambition. And I think just simply put, um, if I'm fought with avarice or if I'm fought with materialism, just give. 
make it a point to give. You give money, give clothes, whatever. Just give, get, get rid of stuff. When, when you give, it heals that passion within you. So I think, you know, if, if I'm in the habit of giving on a daily basis, weekly basis, whatever it is, right? You know, because I, I, I'm listening to this and I, I'm not able to do that. Okay, just get, start small. But with time, you'll find that you find pleasure in this because you find God in this. And then you're not attached to these things anymore. You know, like again, I have a hundred shirts, you know, I, I give in 50, look at that, I'm still able to live, right? I can mm -hmm. still manage things, right? I'm still, I'm fine. But it, it detaches me from the thing. And that brings healing, right? And if I continue doing this, it will bring more healing. And at some point, I might be able to say, you know, with my husband, with my wife, you know what, here, let's do. I actually, <laughs> I know uh, a family that now that you mentioned this, it just it just clicked. Um, unbelievable, really. Like, um, they, they own like a very small like food store here in the area. It might be even almost a shack. It's not really a shack, but. And, and he, he told me once, the owner, he told me, I want only to fulfill, like that's his objective. I want to fulfill my basic needs, my wife's basic needs, and my kids' basic needs, nothing more. So that, that's how he lives. That's his objective. So he's not like going and marketing the place and like, you know, doesn't, he doesn't look to make it a chain or, that, 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 that's all he wants, right? And, and he wants to keep, or he wants to teach his children this way. Well, good for him, you know? Um, but again, for, for the average, average person, just giving uh, would be very helpful. I think that's a great conclusion. Thank you, fathers. That thank wasn't you. an easy one. Thank you, Paul. This was fun. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. Thank you all for joining us.